It's Philippians for Beginners. Uh, this is the eighth lesson in this series. The mature Christian lives righteously. We're going to cover the uh, balance of the book, the epistle rather. Philippians chapter four, verses one to 23. So Paul is at the point in his letter where he's going to offer his final encouragements and greetings to this church, as I mentioned before, which he's very fond of. So in a brief three chapters, I want to do a little review here, some of the things that he's done, just three chapters. He's offered a prayer of thanksgiving and promise and a blessing on the church. He's also briefed them on his condition and his prospects of being freed from prison. Uh, Paul has shared his dilemma of uh, wanting to be with Christ or staying on and continuing his work with them. Uh, from these personal remarks, he moves on to the core issue of his letter, which is an exhortation to continue believing that salvation uh, comes by a system of faith and not a system of law keeping, rule keeping. Now uh, his goal is to point the way to a more mature experience and expression of the Christian faith. That's what he's trying to do. These people are already good Christians. He has nothing negative to say about them, uh, but he wants, to, he wants to push them. Go further, there's more to do. There's, there, there are other heights to, to reach. Uh, so this maturing in Christ has certain features that can be seen in a Christian whose faith is growing. And Paul gives them uh, five examples of Christian maturity. The five are, the mature Christian stands firm in the faith, not moved away from belief by false teaching or adversity. So maturity is not just I know the faith, I understand the faith, but Christian maturity is I don't move away from what I've been taught and what I know when adversity hits or when strange new ideas or fads come into the, uh, come into the church, and they do. Uh, I remember, well, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, in the Churches of Christ, there was this 70 AD movement you know, that was uh, you know, promoting the idea that Jesus has already come and, a lot of people were talking about this and uh, debating it and so on. So there are always fads and ideas that kind of work their way into the church. You know, it's a cyclical thing. It's, it's happened since the beginning and it continues even in our day today. So Paul is saying uh, a mature Christian isn't moved away from the faith, from the gospel, just by every fad and idea that happens to run through the, uh, through the church. The mature Christian imitates Christ in his denial of self in order to be molded in the image of the Lord. What am I shooting for? I want to be like Jesus. That's what I'm shooting for. Uh, number three, the mature Christian rejoices in trial knowing that trials are a way of growing and measuring faith. Uh, some people confuse this with masochism. I'm not happy that there's a trial. I'm not happy that you know, the roof just caved in. I'm not happy about that. But the trials don't destroy my hope. The trials don't destroy the joy I have knowing the promise that I have in Christ. That's the, that's the point here. Uh, the mature Christian seeks the righteousness that comes as a result of believing in Jesus and not righteousness through uh, law keeping. So in this final section, Paul is going to describe the mature Christian in terms of lifestyle. Um, the idea being the mature Christian demonstrates his growth in Christ with his lifestyle by living righteously. So after making this point, he's going to close his letter with a, some kind greetings and, and a blessing on the church. So let's uh, tackle this uh, final point he makes about the mature Christian. The mature Christian uh, you know, lives righteously. In verses uh, one to nine, three ways he mentions that individuals uh, or the church as a group demonstrate their righteous lives and thus their maturity in Christ. Three ways. First, by living in harmony. Living righteously requires living in harmony. Philippians 4.1, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved, 
Note Paul's great affection for the brethren. He says the word beloved twice and he yearns for them, he longs to see them. Uh, he mentions the word joy. Their existence and their growth brought Paul joy. It's just like if you have, a, you, those of you who have children, I think everyone here has children. You have children, you see your children mature. Uh, they finish high school, they graduate high school, you're proud of them. You, that's a, you know, a milestone in their life and perhaps they go on to school or work or training or Votech, whatever, and you see them succeed. You love to see your children, you know, milestones. They're, they marry, they begin having their own family. All these things, you know, we, 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 we love seeing that. Well, Paul is the same way for this particular congregation. He sees them you know, crossing different milestones of maturity and he loves them and it, it encourages him. Um, he talks about them being his joy and crown. They were a credit to him in God's eyes. He took a righteous pride in them. And so he exhorts them a second time concerning the matters that he mentioned in the previous passage. In other words, stand firm in the faith and don't be moved by the false teachers. All right, let's keep reading verse two and three. Here he says, I urge uh, Euodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement, who all, uh, Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So the discord is not at the church level, but between two female disciples. Paul considers both at fault because he gently admonishes both women to live in harmony before the Lord. Uh, we can't say, well, it's just two members, you know, I mean, uh, you know, no big deal. You know, well, uh, <laughs> two members becomes eight members, becomes 16 members, because when people are in a dispute with one another and they're not resolving it, usually they, they gather a posse to their cause, you know, to their righteous cause, and uh, it can cause a lot of uh, problem. Uh, in verse three, the term true companion could also be translated into a man's name. Zygus, so the little, we're not sure here. Uh, in either case, Paul appeals to this person to help the women who were former workers with Paul, help these women find peace with one another since they have been faithful and fruitful servants in the past. And thus they're written in the book of life, just another way of saying they're going to heaven. If your name's written in the book of life, it's the same way of saying you're going to heaven. Uh, Paul does not want their dispute to grow and provide a poor witness for the church and lead to eternal consequences for those women should the situation uh, continue. And then he recalls a time uh, when these women, along with another one of their number, Clement, worked in harmony with himself and other workers. So he said, hey, remember back in the day, we all worked together, we were all in harmony. These two women and Clement and myself, you know, think back on those days, he says. Uh, there may be a, a gentle reminder here to get busy in the Lord's work for these women as a way of remedying the dispute that they're having. The old story, you know, idle hands, the devil's workshop. Maybe they were busy in the Lord and all of a sudden they're not busy in the Lord anymore and they're just you know, fussing with each other. So he's saying, you know, get busy, lots to do. Mature Christians have disagreements and disputes from time to time, but they don't let these destroy the bond of fellowship that they have, nor do they allow their dispute to cause division in the church. I mean, you can't, be in, you can't, take, <laughs> you can't take 400 people, like in our congregation, you can't take 400 sinners and put them all together and tell them you live like a nice family and not have disputes. I mean, you have a family of three, you know, mom, dad, and the kid, you're going to have disputes. So can you imagine when you have 400 sinners together in, a, in the same place? Of course there's going to be disputes. It's how we, it's how we handle these things. You know. We have disputes from time to time, but they don't let these things destroy the bond of fellowship. And so in Ephesians chapter four, we'll skip over to another uh, epistle here where Paul talks about these type of things. He says in Ephesians now, he says, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. What is that calling? We've been called to go to heaven. As people who have been called to go to heaven, we ought not to be fighting with each other down here. 
So he says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. With, and, and what is that manner? How should you walk, he says. Uh, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So Paul in this passage elaborates on the importance of maintaining unity in the church. He begins by reminding them of who they are and what is expected of disciples of Jesus. Again, we've been called to live as He lived. We've been called to be mature in Christ. We're going to heaven. Note also the attitudes and virtues necessary to maintain peace and unity among those who have been forgiven for sin and set for eternal life, but still inhabit a sinful body here on earth. That's the problem, isn't it? We're going to heaven. We have the Spirit of God within us, but we still have dragging around this old flesh. So these situations are not resolved by force or argument, by scheming or creating factions and divisions in the church. Remember, the goal in a dispute is not to win the argument, it's to maintain the unity while we work out our differences. And you know, we always want closure, a little overused word, you know. If you've lived at all, any amount of time, right? Steve is laughing. If you've lived any amount of time, you know, you've learned the hard way that there's a lot of stuff that doesn't get closure. <laughs> it stays just flapping in the wind for years sometimes. So among ourselves as believers, the goal again, we don't want to win the argument or just lock it down so we don't have to talk about it again. No, we want to, we want to dis discuss the things and kind of work things out and maintain the unity so that we can continue to do that in the, in, in the future. And so achieving that requires the mature Christian virtues of humility. What does that mean? Well, humility, having a true measure of oneself, that's humility. I have measured myself accurately for who I am and what I am. You know, someone who doesn't have a true measure of themselves might think that they're always right. They can't be corrected. Well, that's not having a very accurate measure of yourself, is it? So humility is having a true measure of oneself. Gentleness, uh, seeing both sides of a situation, not self-willed, not my way or the highway. Patience, patience is the willingness to bear under difficulty and trials and misunderstandings without losing one's composure or bearing. Tolerance for one another, recognizing the failings and weaknesses of others and not being provoked by these to unkindness or unchristian behavior. That's tolerance. Tolerance isn't anything goes. Oh, you need to be tolerant. Anything goes, you know, whatever, immorality, you know, un unchastity. No. Tolerance is recognizing that other people have weaknesses and understanding that we also have weaknesses. So all of these virtues being motivated by, the Christi by, being motivated by Christian love, in other words, wanting what is best for the other person because of your faith and not because they deserve it. What's the difference between regular love and Christian love? Regular love offers love to a deserving individual who usually sends us some love back. Christian love loves those that don't even deserve our love. That's Christian love. Why do we say Jesus epitomizes Christian love? Well, he's hanging on the cross and he's asking God to forgive the ones that just murdered him. Yeah, that's Christian love in its, you know, in its extremity, if you wish. So Paul says in verse three that mature Christians make an effort, they are diligent to preserve unity. Why are they diligent to preserve unity? Because it's hard, that's why. It's very difficult to preserve unity, why? We're all sinners, we all have pride, we, you know, we, we get crossways with each other. We say things oh, we regret after, or we say things not even realizing how hurtful they may be. That's why we have to be diligent 
to preserve unity among believers because exercising the virtues noted in verse two in a dispute situation isn't easy and it requires emotional and spiritual strength. I can be a patient guy when nothing goes wrong. <laughs> I'm all kinds of patient then. You know, I, I have this idea, you know, when people talk, we've got great customer service at our business and they always seek Great customer service is when you're buying something that they're really quick in getting you your stuff and this and that. That's not customer service, that's easy. You're giving them money, they're giving you a product, they're selling something. No, no, no. Great customer service is when something goes wrong with your order, when they lose your stuff or when there's a mix up or whatever, that's when great customer service happens. Under duress, well, it's the same thing. That's when Christian character comes out, under duress. And so a very public demonstration of Christian maturity visible as believers openly interact with one another. This is the ability to maintain harmony and peace despite differences and disputes that arise from time to time. That's what Paul is talking about here. So the mature Christian demonstrates righteous living in another way. One way is by living in harmony. Another way to demonstrate Christian maturity, living in confidence. How does a mature Christian build and demonstrate confidence and assurance as a child of God? How does he do that? Certainly not by using you know, fleshly ways such as bragging, you know, I'm the greatest, or trash talking, I'm going to beat you, or showing off one's skills or wealth or position. That's not how we show confidence. These are worldly ways of promoting assurance and confidence in one's skill and success. You know, I built this business, this is my empire, this is my bank account, that's, that's the world. Paul describes the person who has confidence not in himself or in his abilities, but rather confidence in the one who provides all that is needed here on earth and promises heaven as well. That's confidence. I'm not confident in me. <laughs> I'm not confident in me. I'm confident in the one who saves me, who provides for me. That's where my, my confidence is. So he says in verse four, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So this section reveals the way that a Christian builds and maintains spiritual confidence. But we have to change the order, okay? We have to change the order in which it is read in order to bring out this information. So I go back and change the order of the passage and you'll see it comes out a little more clearly. So we start with verse six. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Building confidence begins with prayer. That's the number one part. Borrowing from Matthew 6, Paul summarizes Jesus' admonition to not worry about daily needs by simply stating that they should not be anxious about anything. Confidence building requires first and foremost the understanding that God is the one who provides all that we need, not self. We are stewards, we're developers, we're consumers of these things, but He is the provider of these things. Knowing and trusting in this reality removes the anxiety that naturally exists in us when we think that you know, we are ultimately responsible for providing for ourselves and others. Well, obviously, we get up and go to work, sure. God provides the work. He provides the strength. I mean, what if He doesn't provide you with your health? What if He doesn't sustain your strength? You won't be able to get up out of bed to go to the job. What if he doesn't provide the economy or the, the opportunity for that company or the government or whatever you work for to continue? Mature Christians do not worry about how they will obtain what they need. They invest that emotional and spiritual energy, which is many times wasted in worrying, 
They invest that spiritual energy into a regular prayer life that has both components of asking for what is needed physically and emotionally and spiritually and thanking God for what we already have. A dynamic, ongoing prayer life is the source of one's confidence. All right, now let's read, let's go back and read verse four and five. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. So the true mark of confidence is joy, not bravado, not bragging. The Christian who begins to observe God's movement and influence in his life as prayers are answered and God's spirit works various things out, that that person is humbled and filled with joy. You know, you know when we say, that was a God thing. You know, so I, a situation in your life that works out somehow and you say, yeah, that was a God thing. Well, mature Christians recognize that <laughs> the God things that are happening in their lives. This is what Paul is describing in verse five. He says, let the effect of seeing God at work in your life, meaning make you feel humble, let that humility and gentleness be seen. Give glory to God. It's a mark of maturity. It's the confidence in Christ replacing the confidence in self and this transformation is a powerful witness to other people. All right, now let's go forward and skip over six, go to seven. He says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So what does this confidence produce? It doesn't produce bragging, like I'm holier than you are, or I've seen God working and you haven't. It doesn't produce that. This confidence produces peace of mind, a kind of peace that surpasses reasoning. Let me explain. Some rich or powerful, some people who are wealthy and or powerful have peace to a certain degree because they can see and count the resources they have that protect them from harm or poverty. I got a million bucks in the bank. I got a house with a big fence in front of it. You know, I got stuff that protects me and that gives me peace. When I go to bed at night, I don't care if the economy blows up, you know, I got a million bucks in the bank or I've got a, you know, a big farm and I can grow all the food I want, whatever. Mature Christians on the other hand have peace beyond understanding because with God as their provider and savior, their peace of mind is guaranteed because no matter what happens in this life, their resurrection and eternal life are guaranteed through Jesus Christ. Peace beyond understanding. You know the understanding part? That's the part where you can count and you can amass and you have a reason why you have peace. I got a million bucks in the bank, I'm at peace. No, yeah, are you kidding? I got 10 million bucks in the bank. Can you imagine that peace I've got? And of course we know, don't we? We know, don't we? All these people that have 10 million bucks in the bank, do they really have peace? What are they really thinking about? Man, I hope, hope the economy holds. Hope the price of gold stays steady. They're, they're checking the stock market, making sure it's you know, protecting their million bucks. Don't want inflation to eat it away. Confidence and peace are based on our faith, not numbers. Our confidence and peace are based on a person, not things. And so the third way that the Christian demonstrates righteous living, so he does it by living in harmony, living in confidence, knowing that the Lord provides for us. And you know, not just provide, I don't want to concentrate just on money, you know, not just provides what we need to eat and shelter and to take care of our children, but sometimes there's a, a problem, there's a project, there's a, a challenge in life at work. Should I take this promotion? Should I move over here? Should I change my work and start this thing over here? And, and we're like, I, I don't know if I'll be able to do it. Should we have another child? 
I don't know, should we, should we move to the town where our children are living or should we move to the place where our parents are? You know, all these decisions, you know, that having a lot of money or not a lot of money doesn't kind of solve for you. Um, the person who has confidence in God and has a healthy prayer life has confidence that God will work things out for that person. All right, so living in harmony, living in confidence, and then the third one, living in purity. Verse eight and nine, he says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good, uh, of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So in his effort to equip the Philippians for mature spiritual living, Paul provides them with a kind of a testing kit. You know, you have a test, you want to, you have a swimming pool, you have a testing kit, you know, you put it to see if the water, there's enough, you know, whatever chemicals in the water and all that business. So you have a testing kit, right? Well, Paul provi provides them with a spiritual testing kit that will help them determine if what they think and say and do are spiritually acceptable and worthy of mature Christians who are living a pure life. So each of the words serve to examine something from a different perspective. The kit works to examine and rate both incoming and outgoing ideas words and actions so that the individual can monitor his own conduct and make adjustments and evaluate the conduct and attitudes of other people in order to avoid approving by association the unchristian conduct of other people. And so Paul gives himself, even in verse nine, as a model of this human testing kit. If the words are not enough, he says to them, uh, use his life and teaching as a working example of how to live a pure and faithful life as a Christian. He brings the whole section together by saying that testing what they do and following his example are the practical ways that a mature Christian builds the confidence that ultimately leads to the peace you know, that surpasses understanding that he described in verse seven. So it all works together. He goes to his uh, closing remarks <clears throat> in verses uh, uh, 10 to 20. He begins with uh, praise for the Philippians. We know that this congregation had helped Paul in the past and had sent a gift to him with a request to know his circumstances which prompted the writing of this letter. So in verse 10 he says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked the opportunity. First time I read that, I remember, I think, man, that's kind of cheeky. <laughs> you know, thanks for the check. I know, I know, you, you, know you didn't send me one before, but I'm glad I got the check this time. And I, I mean, I knew this wasn't the attitude, but it sure sounded like that when you just kind of read it, you know, on the surface. Well, Paul acknowledges their gift as well as the fact that they had helped them in the past. He even recognizes the fact that they have always been willing to help, but they lack the opportunity. And why was that? Well, think now. His constant traveling, the difficulty of communications. Today, we text somebody, you know, I text somebody who's in China, and they'll get the text right away. In those days, he was moving from place to place, you know, a couple of months here, uh, three months there, two weeks here to send a letter with money and a gift, I mean, they had to go a thousand miles on foot or, or you know, in a boat. It would take weeks, months for messages to be communicated for ordinary people, not like the emperor who had couriers. You know, the ordinary people, messaging was very slow. So he was never in one place long enough for them to kind of send him something, okay? The fact that they knew where he was uh, he was in jail. <laughs> so they knew he was stationary. <laughs> the fact that they knew he was staying there uh, you know, enabled them to organize something and send him a letter and send him a gift. In verse 11, 14, he says, not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. 
I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. So he tempers any worries they may have about his present condition. You know, he's in prison, he needs money, by providing them with insight into his emotional condition. He doesn't want them to think that he is discouraged by his situation. And their gift is helpful and needed, but it isn't what is going to keep him from, you know, it isn't what keeps his spirits up. What keeps him going as a mature Christian is that he has learned to be content. The Greek word here means enough or sufficient. So he learns to be content in whatever circumstances he finds himself in, whether he has a lot or not a lot. Now in verse 13, he answers the question his readers would naturally ask at this point. How are you able to be content with little or much? And his answer is brief, but all encompassing. His contentment is derived from the fact that Christ strengthens. Again, the Greek word there means to enable or empower. In other words, Jesus enables him to live with much without falling into worldliness and lust. And Jesus also empowers him to survive with little without becoming discouraged and questioning God's will. That's how he does it. It doesn't mean, oh, when I have little and I'm here in jail, oh, that's nothing, I just blow that off. You know, peanuts, nothing, nothing to it. No, 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 he's in jail, he's an old man. He's, it's cold, there's no AC, there's no heat. It's damp, the food isn't good. So it's not that he's uncomfortable, uh, excuse me, it's not that he likes the discomfort or he's you know, uh, above it. He just says, the same Lord who enables me to enjoy the good times without losing my head also helps me bear under the hard times without being completely defeated. And isn't that what life is like? Don't we all go, I mean, hopefully we, we don't spend years in prison, but don't we all go through the good times, not so good times? So his contentment is not based on what he has, but rather who he believes. Paul is not introducing a new and, and different idea here. He's using his own situation. You know, a godly man wrongfully imprisoned and suffering from incarceration for four years. He's using his own situation as an, uh, an ultimate example for what mature Christianity looks like. In his own life and especially in his false imprisonment, look, he has stood firm in the faith. He has imitated Christ in his conduct. You don't hear him whining and complaining. He has rejoiced despite his difficult circumstances and he has taught, sought and modeled righteousness by faith to them from the very beginning. So his development as a mature Christian has ultimately brought him to the point in life where he can truly be content in any, I mean, if he can be content in a Roman jail, believe me, he can be content anywhere. Now, what's not written but understood is that this level of contentment is not reserved for only apostles. It's available for all Christians who increasingly depend on Jesus Christ and seek Him out in prayer. It's for everybody. Imagine, imagine if we arrive at this level of contentment. There's nothing that can destroy us. There's nothing in this world that can defeat us. So Paul adds an additional line thanking them in order to you know, underscore his appreciation and, and he's commending them for doing a good deed, you know, sending him some money. He raises their act beyond simple charity by saying that with their giving they have shared, fellowshiped is the word he uses, they have shared in his suffering by sacrificing uh, to help relieve his suffering, they've in effect shared in his suffering. Need to move on here, he says, uh, <clears throat> you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, 
well pleasing to God. So finishing out here, uh, Paul continues his comments concerning their gift by reviewing past instances, instances rather, where they helped him financially, especially at times when it was crucial because no one else was helping him. He not only appreciates their history of giving, but also the blessings that the Philippians receive on account of their generosity. I'm happy because God is going to bless you for having blessed me. And he confirms that their recent gift delivered by Epaphroditus, one of his helpers from the church at Colossae, has more than fulfilled all of his material needs. And then he then uses another imagery to describe their gift. In verse 12, he described it as a fellowship in his suffering. This time, the Old Testament imagery of a sacrifice offered at the temple in the proper way for which God was pleased. So verse 19 and 20, he says, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever, amen. So the result of their kind action of caring for Paul's needs is that he prays that God will provide for all their needs. The difference, however, is that God has unlimited resources and He can supply any kind of need. You need money, He can supply that. You need courage, He can supply that. You need patience, He can supply that. You need long suffering to be able to bear something that is burdening you, He can supply that. The idea reaches back to the idea, previous one, that contentment comes when we realize that God can and does do this for us. Paul completes his comments and prays for their gift by praying that God will supply all of their needs. He finishes the section with a short, it's called a doxology, meaning spontaneous praise, uh, giving God the glory for all things, including the good deed done by the Philippians in sending the money. So the last few verses, the final greeting and blessing, uh, verse 21 and 22, he says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus, the brethren all uh, who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. So as was the custom, the greetings part of the letter was at the end and not at the beginning as it is today. He sends personal greetings to the church in Philippi. Um, those with Paul, Luke, Epaphroditus, Timothy and others also send their greetings through his letter. Paul had converted other prisoners, Onesimus for example, Philemon's runaway slave. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the series, many of Caesar's elite bodyguards, you know, the Praetorian Guard, they had heard the gospel through Paul and these also were, imagine, <laughs> the guards who are guarding them are saying, hey, 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 say hello for us too. <laughs> they're, they're guarding the prisoner and they want to be included in his, in his letter to the brethren. You know, amazing, amazing stuff. Uh, and of course, not to mention other officials and servants that Paul came into contact with. And then the last verse, the final blessing, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your uh, spirit. Uh, grace, the saving favor of God, is the most precious blessing that Paul could ask for on behalf of these, it his uh, uh, most cherished uh, brethren. Well, there's only one lesson here. You know, I always try to finish with some lessons. There's only one lesson, and here it is. Maturity leads to contentment and peace. If you take away a lesson, maturity leads. Why should I strive for Christian maturity? To please God, to make Him happy? No. Of course, this satisfies Him, but He is happy when we are blessed. So striving for Christian maturity leads to contentment and peace. The climax of this letter is found in the section where Paul explains that he has learned, it's a process, to be content. So maturing in Christ is the learning process that brings us to that point of spiritual development where we are able to fully depend on Jesus to empower us for every situation. I depend on Christ for everything. The great reward for arriving at this level of maturity is that it creates in us the marvelous state of contentment that Paul speaks about here. This contentment is what he describes in verse seven as the peace that surpasses understanding. There's no earthly reason to be this content because you're depending on somebody that no one sees. <laughs> and yet you know he is there. So there are two sides of the same coin. 
One describes our condition, that's contentment, and the other describes how we feel, peace beyond understanding. All right, remember, maturity leads to contentment and peace. That's the end of our series on Philippians. Thank you for hanging in there. I appreciate your attention. <laughs>